Hello everybody, Dr. Yu here and welcome back to the channel. With the spread of the Omicron variant, it's more important than ever to understand just what the COVID vaccines can do for your body to see if they'll actually protect you and if you haven't been vaccinated yet, to help make a decision about whether to get vaccinated. When the vaccines were first released in December last year, my team and I had done a tremendous amount of work making a teaching document for medical students to advise them of how the vaccine works in the body. Problem is, it wasn't meant for the public. So to help non-medical members of the public, I tried to find a video on YouTube that has simple explanations and nice animations to comment on and do a medical peer review of sorts. I think I found the one. It's from ASAP Science, and it was produced in December of last year. Let's see if the content is still relevant and helpful for us in December 2021. There's a lot of excitement right now around the record speed vaccines for COVID-19, some of which are already starting distribution in parts of the world. First of all, I love the animations and the animated speakers. They're really engaging. I love it. Not been widely used before. We wanted to explain how they work and what happens to your body from the moment that needle touches your skin. Like the vaccines we're used to seeing, these vaccines will be injected into the upper muscle of your arm. So first comment about the upper muscle of the arm. This muscle is known as your deltoid muscle. It's a big muscle, it's fairly close to the skin surface, so it's very hard to miss. Why do we inject vaccines into muscles? Well, because muscles have a lot of blood supply going through them. So immune cells can be brought into the muscle and mount a quicker immune response to the vaccine, and so that the blood can wash away the foreign particles in the vaccine to minimize the risk of side effects. The blood basically carries the foreign vaccine particles to the kidneys and liver, which basically gets rid of any non-active components of the vaccines. Now, some influencers have questioned whether we should be aspirating the needle before we inject the vaccine into the muscle. You can see that when I got vaccinated, the nurse who did my vaccination did not aspirate. So as an N of 1, I'm still fine. I think in general it's okay to not aspirate before injecting if all you're doing is to vaccinate someone through the deltoid muscle. Aspiration is usually done to make sure that the injected substance doesn't go into any of the big blood vessels, which could cause a problem. And in medicine, we typically aspirate before injection for more serious injections where we're not totally clear where we're injecting into, such as blind joint injections. For the deltoid muscle, though, you can Google any picture of shoulder anatomy, and you can see that there's not really any big blood vessels around where the deltoid muscles are. It's basically just skin, muscle, and bone. So I'm okay with the nurse not aspirating prior to her injecting me with the vaccine. But unlike typical vaccines, which introduce inactive or weakened forms of a virus, these will release genetic material called messenger RNA. So what exactly does this mRNA do? Well, in a regular cell of your body, you have DNA inside of the nucleus. And this DNA stores all the information and instructions important to the functioning of your cells, your body, and ultimately makes you, you. Inside your cell is machinery that reads through your DNA and transcribes it into mRNA, which then leaves the nucleus and goes into your cytoplasm. And it's here that the ribosomes in your cells read the RNA and depending on the specific code, build a series of amino acids which fold in on themselves. Again, I just love the graphics here. Which keep you alive and functioning. This process is known as translation. They've correctly shown what happens naturally within your bodies. It's important to point out that mRNA is not a new substance to the body. It is not a foreign substance. In fact, you and I, simply being alive, we're making thousands and thousands of copies of mRNA every single minute. We do this in order to produce the proteins that we need to live. So hair is a protein. Skin is a protein. When you cut yourself, your blood uses proteins to clot and to stop the bleeding. The vaccine, even though it's new medical technology, is introducing into our bodies nothing more than a molecule that we already have. When that mRNA from the vaccine has done what it's meant to do, the body actually has natural enzymes called RNAases. These are proteins that break down other particles that the body doesn't need. So the mRNA from the vaccine doesn't last in the body for very long at all. It's broken down, most likely within a couple weeks, which makes long-term side effects much less likely. In fact, it's this process that viruses take advantage of in the first place. They insert their own genetic information into you and then your cell machinery unwittingly starts taking that information and building proteins to help create more viruses. Yes, this description is accurate. Viruses are that creepy. That's why we don't want to get them in the first place. So back to the needle. The mRNA that is being injected into you from the vaccine also carries genetic instructions. But in this case, it's only coding for one small part of the virus. Instead and this of the figure is a bit thing. inaccurate. 
mRNA doesn't just come out of the needle in its naked linear form. It actually needs to be wrapped in a lipid coat. Think of it like a tiny, tiny soap bubble. Otherwise, if the mRNA is injected naked into the body, it's just going to be degraded by the natural enzymes like the RNAs, as I spoke about. RNA is normally a very unstable molecule that doesn't last very long in the body. So the revolutionary genius behind the vaccine is that humans are now able to coat the mRNA molecule inside a lipid nanoparticle, a very small soap bubble, to protect them and make them last long enough in the body in order to do its job of activating the immune system. You've probably seen SARS-CoV-2 represented like this, with the spikes on it, and it's this spike protein, which on its own is harmless, that the vaccine's mRNA codes for. The mRNA makes its way into the cytoplasm of your cells, where the ribosomes read the information and start to create the spike proteins. Once the protein is made, it goes to the cell membrane, and then your cell breaks down and destroys the injected mRNA instructions. So this again is a little bit inaccurate. After the spike protein is made in the cell, it is then broken down within the cell into little fragments. And then it is these little fragments that are presented to the cell surface to activate the immune system. The other way of activating the immune system is that the spike protein is then released from the cell where it's broken down into little fragments within the bloodstream, triggering an immune response that way. So the antigen, which is the trigger for the immune response, is actually little fragments of the spike protein, not the spike protein itself, which is why, with vaccination, a bunch of different types of antibodies are created against the components of the spike protein. And each of these antibodies target a different region of the spike protein. This means that whenever new variants arise, and remember, a variant just has different parts of the spike protein being different, but most parts of the spike protein are still the same. Vaccine-induced immunity can still generate sufficient amounts of antibodies that are needed to detect and kill the new variant. Because out of all the different antibodies that were produced by the vaccine, some antibodies will still target parts of the spike protein on the new variant that is the same as other variants. This is actually one of the many reasons why vaccine immunity is better than natural immunity. I actually did a video about this, and you can check it out. So what good does having a tiny fragment of viral spike in your body do? What well, gives your body, and more importantly, your immune system, a preview of what the virus looks like without causing disease? So what he just said, it gives your body a preview of what the virus looks like without causing disease. That is the definition of a vaccine. Now, I have no idea why some people are saying that they changed the definition of a vaccine in order to accommodate the COVID-19 vaccines. We've just shown that they work in the exact same way as other vaccines do. Suddenly, your antibodies will notice it and go, well, this doesn't belong here, which triggers an immune response to recognize and prepare your body for the real thing without ever having to come in contact with the actual virus itself. Your immune system essentially gets a head start by creating powerful antibodies that can neutralize and kill the real virus. And this antibody memory is stored in your B cells so that if you are ever infected in the future with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, your body now has the upper hand. This is known as an adaptive immune response. This description is quite accurate. It is exactly what the vaccine will do for you. Any vaccine. Just one thing. The term adaptive immune response is quite general. There's actually two main components to your immune response. One component is called humoral immunity, and that's the antibody part of the response, involving B cells that produce a lot of antibodies that fight the virus while it's still in the bloodstream. The other component is called cell-mediated immunity, and that's the component involving T cells that kill infected body cells and prevent the virus from multiplying. Both types of cells, B cells and T cells, memorize the foreign particle that corresponds to the virus, helping your body mount attacks against the virus in case you become exposed to it in the future. So why haven't mRNA vaccines been used before? While they are relatively new, researchers have actually been experimenting with them for decades. But in the past, they've been very unstable. Enzymes in your body would break down the mRNA quickly, so they needed to be packaged well. The ones being released now have the mRNA encased in lipid nanoparticles, which essentially protect the mRNA from being degraded. This is a lovely graphic of what I just talked about. The soap bubble representing the lipid nanoparticle that contains the mRNA. Since they're more unstable than other types of vaccines, they have to be kept cold. For example, the Pfizer vaccine has to be stored at minus 70 degrees Celsius and at normal refrigerated temperatures can only last five days. Of course, a global pandemic has certainly increased the funding and resources going towards these types of vaccines, which has helped to accelerate their development. Accelerate their development, but not rushed. The proper science still went into the vaccine research. 
phase one, two, and three studies, as well as the aftermarket studies. You can watch my video on were the vaccines rushed for more. What makes these vaccines so appealing is that unlike other vaccines, they can be made in a lab with readily available materials and actually made much quicker than other types of vaccines. Instead of fully developing non-infectious viruses and then injecting them, these mRNA vaccines can sort of pass many hurdles by using your own body in an ingenious way. It's also far more cost effective to create mRNA molecules rather than the proteins themselves and also a lot more scalable, which is helpful when we are in a global pandemic waiting for a vaccine. Bingo. Did you know that back in the day, flu vaccines were made using chicken eggs. They literally had to grow thousands and thousands of batches of chicken eggs in order to produce the flu vaccines that we need. They actually grow the flu virus inside them and then inactivate the flu virus to produce the vaccine. So much hassle. The mRNA vaccine certainly represents a revolution in terms of making vaccines safely, cheaply, and at scale. So is it safe? And given that it's a relatively new technology, should you be concerned at all? Well, that's what these initial trial stages have been for, not only to test whether or not they work and cause immunity, but to make sure they have minimal side effects. As of now, around 70,000 people have been given these vaccines with no serious concerns, a caveat being that the full research hasn't been published yet as of recording this video. So one year on, we have that data now. You can check out the Health Canada website for this. Let's go through it together. So if you go through the Health Canada website, they actually have a weekly report summarizing reported adverse events following COVID-19 vaccination in our country. And it's important to note that these reported adverse events is not technically a side effect. A side effect implies a causative interaction between the vaccine and whatever comes after. A reported adverse event is simply just what comes after a vaccine. Again, if you stub your toe after vaccination, you wouldn't necessarily say that the vaccine caused you to stub your toe. So you can see here that up to including December 3rd, over 61 million doses of the vaccine has been administered. And there were only 6,581 total serious adverse events that followed, representing 0.011% of all doses administered. If you then break down this total number of serious adverse events into what they actually are in terms of true safety signals, and you can see that there are actually three true safety signals. So these safety signals would be rates of adverse events that are higher than the baseline rate of these events happening in the general population. You can see that blood clots is the first true signal, but that's only with the AstraZeneca vaccine. Guillain-Barre syndrome is another safety signal, but again, only with the AstraZeneca vaccine. The only true safety signal for the mRNA vaccines that we still use in Canada is myocarditis, inflammation of the heart muscle, and pericarditis, inflammation of the lining around the heart. So then we can click here to look at the actual occurrences of reported myocarditis and pericarditis after the mRNA vaccines. You can see that up to and including December 3rd, there were only 1,428 reports of myocarditis, pericarditis reported amongst the Canadian population. And that's out of a total of 61 million vaccination doses given. That will be a risk level of 0.002%, highly, highly unlikely especially compared to the risks of COVID-19 hospitalization and death that we know follow COVID-19 infection. But it's important to remember that just because it's safe doesn't mean there won't be any soreness or pain. Some recipients did report aches and pains, and as of now, you'll need to receive two shots to ensure efficacy. Actually, three shots, it seems like, of the mRNA vaccines are needed. And this is okay, because booster shots exist for other diseases too. For instance, adults need tetanus every 10 years. Children need multiple shots of measles and polio vaccines in order to get the adequate protection they need as infants. After all, what's the alternative? Would you rather get infected and have a risk of dying and hospitalization from COVID? I saw a really great analogy by the professor Shane Crotty, who works in vaccine research, and he said, It's not unlike going to the gym and getting exercise and really sore muscles. A bit of pain can be a positive sign that good things are happening. Sometimes you have to earn your immunity just like you have to earn those biceps you wanted so bad. This is a bit of a funny analogy, because the underlying mechanisms are different. Sore muscles after a workout means the muscles are recovering, and sore muscles and body aches and fever and whatnot after a vaccine means the immune system is reacting, as it should, to the chemicals inside the vaccine to give yourself immunity and protection from future exposures of the virus. I do agree. It's normal to feel a little bit sick after the vaccine. It means the vaccine is working to give you the immune protection that you need. And for the real scary side effects like myocarditis after the MRI vaccines, 
Number one, it's super rare. It's rarer than getting blood clots from a birth control pill. And it's a treatable condition. So make sure to go see your doctor or go to the emergency room as you would anyway if you feel symptoms of chest pain, difficulty breathing, heart palpitations, or dizziness. We know you've been asking about these vaccines a lot. We've also had our questions. So we hope that all this information was useful and concise and educational for you because it does sort of help make things seem less unknown and scary in a very strange time. Great. Overall, I thought this was a very informative video. It's definitely aged very well over this last year. I hope you found my reactions and my additional information to be helpful. If you learned something new, please give this video a like and subscribe to my channel so that you can be kept up to date for when future reaction and peer review videos come out. Thanks, everybody. Take care and stay safe and healthy.